this evening. Pneumatology is the study of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we've been several weeks on uh, several weeks on this. Uh, there's still quite a bit to go, so but there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> so we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there as soon as we get there. Uh, I talked a little bit uh, last week uh, about not grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Um, talked a little bit, I believe, about the result of the believer's sins against the Holy Spirit, and that sins committed against any member of the Trinity don't you, they don't uh, result in a loss of salvation. Remember, salvation is by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, and it's not achieved by any works that we do. So any works that we uh, do contrary are, are not a loss of, of that. Um, there's Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God pur purposely made it to where it would not have anything to do with our works because he didn't want anybody standing there saying, I got here because of me. Because that's a, that's a boastful, prideful thing to say. And, and, you know, the proud he knoweth afar off. But everybody that's there will have to say, the only reason I'm here is because of Jesus. That's, that's, that's what it's all about there. So believers rest secure in that promise of John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So uh, in Hebrews seven twenty five, the Bible also says, wherefore he, meaning Jesus, is able to save them to the ut uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he never live, he ever liveth to make uh, intercession for them. And uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but I'll go ahead if it bears repeating. Uh, when you talk about what sin does, remember we had a study of sin, and if you missed that, that's also on our website. You can go to that and, and check that out as well. But it does break our fellowship with God, first of all. Secondly, it will cause God to withhold blessings from, uh, from us. Uh, and thirdly, unless sin is judged by the individual. Remember when the Bible says, "Judge not." Uh, if you judge yourself, you'll be not judged, right? So if we'll judge ourselves, then the judgment of God doesn't have to fall because we've already judged ourselves. So the person needs to, uh, to judge themselves and confess their sin, repent of it. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then the chastening of God uh, will come to the life of that believer. Uh, quenching the Spirit also may result in the loss of many souls dear to us. Many people, God will do anything to get us back where we need to be, including take people that are close to us. I mean, that's just how, that's just how it goes. I mean, there's been many people saved at a funeral because God reached down and took a loved one, and that loved one was saved, most times, the, the loved one was saved, and then they're there, and now uh, the gospel's given out, and if you want to see this dear lady, or you want to see this dear, this, this dear man again, the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ, and making a personal profession of faith in Him. Gospel goes out, and people get saved as a result. Uh, there are some people that just did not have a... a, a, a and my dad's got a great story uh, about a family that was dear to us, that it was good, good friends with, and uh, uh, they grew up, got away from the Lord. And uh, but uh, at, when the guy was coming home, and uh, he had worked a double shift, and he was coming around the corner, fell asleep at the wheel, and ran into a tree, and it snapped, broke his neck, and he died instantly. There were over a hundred people saved at his funeral. I mean, what an awesome thing. But you know what? That's what you remember like uh, 
you remember this, this, this past week how I said, if I could bring honor to God and glory to God by my life or by my death, then that's what I want to do. In this instance, this young man's death did far more than his life would have ever done because it touched that, that many people and brought over. So, you know what, and that's another thing. You know, when we're not witnessing and we're not doing what we're supposed to do, if we shorten our time, then sometimes our, our death will benefit others in the way that they can, uh, they can hear uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and become saved as a result if they accept that. So, uh, but sin results in a loss of the joy of salvation. So, like I said, remember, uh, it's not always feelings, but it's nice to have good, joyous feelings uh, uh, concerning salvation. And David even had to pray when he was getting right to restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He didn't even say of my salvation. He said of thy salvation. It's God's salvation. And sin also may result in the loss of our testimony to the unsaved. So, now we're going to talk about the way to forgiveness is with all sin. There's got to be repentance. And this is evidence in returning to God. 1 John 1, 9 gives us directions for forgiveness and restored fellowship. Right? Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there's sins against the Holy Spirit by unbelievers as well. Uh, and we'll, I wanted to mention these because it bears mentioning uh, in our study. But unbelievers can commit sin against the Holy Spirit by resisting his drawing and by doing uh, and doing despite unto the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers may also commit the unpardonable sin against the Holy Spirit, which is that final rejection and staying in your sin and being what? That's the final rejection. Uh, that you're just, you're just, it just pretty much you're sealed. That's the last chance you're going to have, and you're you're just set for hell at that point. So, uh, quickly resisting the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Now, whenever the gospels preach, the Holy Spirit empowers the unsaved people that they might respond to the invitation, which is why you have an invitation. I have not for the life of me understand why some of these churches have gotten rid of the practice of an invitation. That's the, you're, you're canceling out what the Holy Spirit's supposed to be doing. They're supposed to respond, be able to respond to the, the draw of the Holy Spirit of God in order to be saved. So he also encourages them, he draws them to place their faith in Christ for salvation. They may resist the Spirit and refuse to yield their life for salvation. Now remember, he draws, but he doesn't force them. God will never force you. You'll wish you had, but he'll never force you to do what he's trying to get us to do. Doing despite unto the spirit of grace. The second type of sin is similar in that it's both resistance and denunciation of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit as well. There are those that just totally denounce it and they, they just, they do all that. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it says, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Then we have that. We have the unpardonable sin against the Holy Spirit, which is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that is only mentioned in the Bible three times. In scriptures, the first uh, time it's mentioned is in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31 and 32. Wherefore, and this is Jesus speaking, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, 
but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever shall speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's the first mention of it. Second mention of it is in Mark chapter 3, verse 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And the third mention is found in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. In each case, Jesus was speaking to non-believers. Okay? Uh, they, knowing Christ's claims and having adequate understanding of his message, his works, attempted to credit those works to Satan. Remember, they said, oh, he hath an unclean spirit, or uh, he, 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 you know, he casts out devils in the name of devils, that kind of thing, right? They had a total thing. Now, Jesus did not say they had committed the unpardonable sin, but he did warn them they were in danger of doing so. That's not a line you want to cross. Very, I mean, you don't want to cross it ever. I mean, that's, that's a bad thing all around. And there are those who believe the unpardonable sin can only be committed during the earthly ministry of, ministry of Christ. But, however, there's not enough evidence to prove that conclusively. So we don't, wanna, we don't want people doing that, obviously. Uh, the sin may be understood as resistance or denial of the person and the call of the Holy Spirit until the heart has grown hard and indifferent uh, to urgings and drawings, you're not long, no longer feeling it. They're no longer feeling the draw. They're no longer hearing the tug, feeling the tug, hearing the voice, uh, and heeding the call. They, they don't have any of that anymore. And then uh, uh, until death overtakes the unbeliever, or Christ returns for the church at the rapture, there's no forgiveness because the person has rejected the only means of being saved until it was too late. So if you keep on and you keep on denying and you keep on not, not getting saved and, and, and all of these things, then there comes a point in time when either death is going to call, Jesus is going to come, either way it settles it and you've set yourself for hell and chosen it. Because you resisted, you didn't, you didn't, you know, yield yourself, and you waited till it was too late. Now, there's, there's, there's few things that are really uh, as bad as waiting too late to get something. I've missed great deals on stuff because I just, I thought I was going to get in on it, and then, oh, well, it, I was too late to get in on it, so I lost out on it. But see, that, that's all right because whether or not I needed what I was thinking I was going to get in the first place, eh, here or there. But when you're talking about the eternal soul, you need to get it settled. You need to get it right, and you need to get it secured. I mean, there's no other priority that should be on anybody's mind except knowing you're right with God. But see, they don't know they need that priority. That they, they're walking blind in darkness, and it's up to us who, who are the light of the world now. Jesus was the light while he was here, but now his light is within us, the Holy Spirit of God. Now we are to tell them what their priority should be. Hey, listen, are you aware of this? Are you aware of that? Are you aware that, you know, we don't live for, for, forever down here? Your soul will live forever, but it has to go somewhere. And it's either up or down. It's heaven or hell. It's cut and dry. Just like that. So we don't want to have people wait too late. Now, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the filling of the Spirit. I want to uh, reiterate a couple things from that. And there's a great deal of misunderstanding in various churches over the filling and gifts and baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've gone through some of those. 
There's no reason for confusion. Okay, God's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 4, 13, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And the Bible makes clear the special ministries of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the filling, the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit's repeated act of, whole, of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer it's not necessarily a sign of salvation per se, but it's a ministry of maturity and service. Okay, yes, I mean, that's a great, it's a great, if you got the Holy Spirit, obviously you're saved. That would be a great indicator. <coughs> Excuse me. But in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 4, and, verse, and uh, also chapter 4, verse 31, which we'll read here in just a few minutes, is the filling of the Spirit resulted in the Word of God being spoken in boldness and power. Okay? Believers were strengthened and souls were saved and added to the church. Because the witness went out, the power of God was on it, and it did something. And then the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There still should be people being saved. Absolutely. And that's, that's what we, we absolutely need to get our minds around. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then in chapter 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That tells me the Holy Spirit is all we need to have boldness. I mean, I, through my years, I've heard people try to pray for boldness, but you know what? You already have it. It's in there. Because let something rub you the wrong way. You have boldness, don't you? You got no problem stepping up and saying, hey, that ain't right, or I don't like that, or it ought not to be done like that. If something rubs you the wrong way, you got no problem saying your mind. So there shouldn't be any problem with saying, your, saying our mind if we have the mind of Christ. He's gave us the Holy Spirit of God. And we see boldness and power. Okay? So that's a great thing. It's also clear that the filling of the Spirit is necessary for the acceptable, successful service in the church. <clears throat> if the deacons of Acts 6 must meet the qualification of the full uh, of being full of the Holy Ghost, it would be understood that the other officers in the church must also meet the same qualifications. Anybody that's going to do that, we ought to be that way. That should be easy for us to do, is be filled with the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5 informs us that, chapter 5 informs us that the result of being filled with the Spirit produces joy. It produces joy. We find that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Galatians chapter 20, uh, 5, to verses 22 and 23 <clears throat> indicate that the filling of the Holy Spirit produces fruit in the believer. We talked about a little bit about that. So let's, let's look here uh, down just a little bit. On the evidence of the filling of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit is a spiritual experience. It may involve uh, emotional feelings. However, we're not to understand that it's always an overwhelming emotional experience. There have been times when I, had, I knew I was full of the Spirit. Usually, I'm getting, the first thing that happens is I get really hot. My temperature goes up. My face starts getting really red. I, I just want to start throwing my coat. And I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not, like, emotional. But there have been times when I'm teaching, when I'm preaching, when it just, woo, 
it just, it, it hit me like a ton of brick. And it's no wonder it was a cloven tongue of fire because I'm telling yeah, yeah, we, we might have to repaint a couple times in here. We got some painters. Good, we can, I can preach the paint off this wall. We'll get it right back up. And we'll do it all again next time. I like that. But sometimes we may not be aware that the filling of the Spirit's actually taken place until it's observed in our lives, uh, which, you know, in our actions, our end results. If the emotional, spiritual experience was the evidence of being Spirit-filled, many would seek the experience, but not the filling. See, this is the problem with the big churches out there today and those that want to go away from the King James Bible. All they want to do is they want the feels, but they don't want the fills. That's what they're after. They're after the feeling. They're after the emotional attachment. They're after the, the workup. They want the feels, but they don't want the fills. They don't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They just want the, the, the high of being, uh, uh, being in the presence of God, if that makes sense. I mean, that's, that's exactly what they do. Now, the Pharisees, as you, as you mentioned, they were all outward appearance. They wanted all the applause. They wanted all the eyes on them. I've got the key of knowledge. You come to me for the spiritual things. I, I, they want the chief seats in the synagogues and make the big long oratory speeches and prayers. And the, the, they all wanted that for the praise of men. And that's where they got up. But inside, Jesus said, inside your, your witted sepulchers, <clears throat> your dead men's bones. So that's how you know when it's real. It's the filling of the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit of God, it can be emotional. Now, I'm not saying that we should never be emotional. Don't, don't take me the wrong way. If the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, the Word of God gets a hold of you, I don't care if it's in a song, I don't care if it's in a testimony, I don't care if it's uh, through the preaching, and you feel moved, then go with it. If that means you have to get up and you praise, praise the Lord, you know what, you're not going to offend me. You want to run, take a Baptist, run around the block, I don't really care. You do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. But we don't just seek after the emotional fulfillments Without the filling of the, because all the filling of the Spirit is going to dictate all the rest. It's going to change everything. It'll change everything how we think, how we act, how we talk, how, everything. It can, it can even affect uh, the, the way we present ourselves when we're filled with the Spirit of God. So it's important that we be filled with the Spirit of God, but just that doesn't mean that it shouldn't carry with it some emotion, but it does mean that it's not dependent upon emotion. You don't have to work it up. Church is all over. That's what they do. They got to stand there and sing for an hour to try to work themselves up to feel in the how they want to feel. Nothing wrong with singing for an hour. But if you're only doing it to get the feels and not the fill, you've wasted your time. Believers are commanded to be filled with the Spirit of God. And that's not just preachers and deacons and trustees and financial people. That's every single person who has accepted Christ as a personal Savior is commanded to be filled. Filled with the Spirit of God, Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And that's the only ministry, the Holy Spirit, that's sought by the believer. Okay, all other ministries of the Holy Spirit come as a result of our salvation. Since the filling of the Holy Spirit is a daily need in the life of the believer, it has to be sought after every day. What, not just Sunday? You mean not just on Wednesday? 
every day. Every day. Because we need that. Because God can do some great things with us every single day. If he added to the church daily, wouldn't that suggest there were some people filled with the Holy Spirit every day? Out preaching, out teaching, out witnessing, wherever they could, however they could. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, it's a, it's a continuing filling, is des- a continuous feeling, filling is desirable. However, our fallen nature seems to make this improbable, if not impossible. Now, the meaning of being filled with the Spirit, as I previously stated, it means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. The uh, analogy of Ephesians 5.18 that we just read indicates that wine, as a wine controls a person under its influence, so the Holy Spirit will control a person under his influence. Okay? And so the Holy Spirit's a person, and you're a person, each personality, and <clears throat> each has a personality, and therefore there's two intellects, emotion and will, to be considered. There's emotion side, and then there's just your will. Some people are on board with that uh, emotion, but they don't want to surrender that will. That's, that's, that's the thing that's going to make you end up doing the things that God wants you to do. That, that's, I believe that that point right there is what separates a hearer from the word and a doer of the word. It's that will thing. That little four-letter word keeps us from doing what we should be doing because we just won't surrender our, make our will his. That's just all there is to it. So, uh, does filling mean that a person has lost his personality as he yields to the control of the Spirit? No. The answer is no. The best analogy I've heard to explain this phenomenon is the story of the iron and the forge. When the iron is placed in the fire of the forge, it yields to the heat. It can then be shaped or molded as desired, yet it retains the characteristics of iron. So as we yield to the Holy Spirit, we, he can shape and mold our lives and yet allow us to have our own personality. You'll find a lot of personality through the Bible. <clears throat> with, uh, with, with all the men that wrote that the Holy Spirit used, he used their own personalities and how they communicated to, to, to efficiently do this. And he could do the same with us. Now, the way to the be filled with the Holy Spirit of God is uh, there's nothing magical about the process of being filled with the Holy Spirit, nor is there some shortcut that allows the filling without the devotion and commitment of the seeker. However, the way to filling is quite simple. It can be characterized in two words. Those words are yield and obey. If we yield, that's submitting to what the process, right? We're submitting ourselves to the process of change through the Holy Spirit of God, and then we obey what he's doing, what he's telling us to do. He's, we're being made into something else. That's what the Bible is supposed to do. The Bible is designed to change us, just like that iron in the forge, you get, that, you get that heat on there, and then the metal gets red hot. You can twist it. You can do whatever you want. You can mold it however you want. But it's still an iron. It's still whatever, whatever went into the fire. It's still that. But it's being made into something else that's useful. Okay? So that's what God wants to do with you and I. And sometimes that process is not fun. That process of that heat applied is not fun, or the pressure applied is not fun. But realize, we are being made into something else that will be better use for God to be able to use here uh, while we're here. Okay, so... Um, 
That's how we do it. It's yielding and obeying. Yielding the control of our life to his control, yielding our sins to Jesus for his forgiveness, obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit certainly leads to being filled with the Spirit of God. Prayer is a vital part of yielding. That, will, that gets us in a position where we can drop our will. And that's another, that's another just robbery for people. And pe I, I wish people could really fully understand how much they've been robbed. They've been robbed of, the, of, of, of the, the right Bibles in these places. They've been robbed with the opportunity to let the Holy Spirit let them respond, which also robs them of yielding. No better sign of a yield can you find than somebody on their knees. I'm going to, I'm going to, and that's why you, you'll see uh, how, how they handle people in foreign countries. And remember there was a, there was a, a several years back, there was a, a mass bunch of beheadings um, as, a re, as a result of these people that were there. And any time that you saw anything at all, they forced them to their knees you will be forced on your knees. You are being forced to submit to doing what we're going to do to you. Regardless, you have no control over it. Okay? That's, but see, when you don't have the availability, you don't have the altar call, you don't have any solid doctrine going out from the word of God, you're literally robbing people of the change that God could do in them. It could be the difference in somebody, you know, just being your average layman to being a Billy Sunday or a Charles Spurgeon or a Tom Malone Sr. Every one, every one of those men that we look to and we look up to and we say, wow, they did great things. Billy Graham. Do you know what Billy Graham had to do to be great? Let me show you. He had to yield. He had to yield. And he did that at an old-fashioned altar. Same with Billy Sunday. Same with a lot of those people. You can't take that away. You just can't. That's why we always give an invitation. With the exception of Wednesday, we don't really give, you know, we don't hold back on invitations. This is a teaching thing, but we still, it doesn't mean that we, we couldn't. If the Spirit so led, I would, I would open it up in a heartbeat. But that's something we take from the Spirit of God. But on Sundays, you're going to find Sunday a.m. and Sunday p.m., you're going to find an altar call here. Because why would I rob you? Why would, and it's robbing myself of the study, of the hours, of, of putting in, with, 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 with getting alone with God, with searching the scriptures and putting them together. And, and for what? Why put something together? Why have all this time invested and effort invested into something that will literally do nothing for anyone? Because I don't give them the chance. I take the chance away. That's not good. That's not good. We need that. And there have been plenty of times on a Wednesday night God led and we had a we had an altar call and the altars were full. Well, you have to you have to give people a chance to respond. And so uh, let's see here. I got a couple minutes. That's kind of a big thing to get into. I'm going to stop right there, I think. Oh, look, a highlighter. That would have helped me earlier.
because we're we're about to get into some of the tongue the sign of the gift of tongues and 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 things like that so um that's kind of a big big subject so i'm not going to start a big subject with three minutes to go we we'll just uh, we'll just let that pass for now, but I hope you can see how important the Holy Spirit is in this whole thing. It's everything in the life of the believer. It, it it's like the lifeblood that we have. It's our power. It's our guidance. Our teaching. It's our everything. The power we have to overcome comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Tap into that. We don't have to live and walk in defeat. We could just tap into what God's already given us, have the boldness to go forth and to do all the things that he tells us to do. Okay? And when you're full with, filled with the Holy Spirit, man, that's, that's the, the time at most that you want to run at hell with a squirt gun. I'm taking a super soaker, by the way. I'm going to...